This is Heart Rhythm TV, and I'm Dan Aliesh, here with breaking news. Now, the topic we're going to discuss today is posterior wall isolation and ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation. And as you can see from our first slide here, this reflects how I feel about it, kind of like Socrates, knowing that I know nothing. And that's why I'm joined today by people who know a lot more than I do. Um, welcome, Dr. Dave Delergio of Emory University School of Medicine. And welcome, Dr. Peter Kissler of the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks very much, Dan. Now, they're here to discuss uh, the newest interesting pieces of data. Dr. Kissler presented at ESC the results of his CAPLA study for posterior wall isolation. And Dr. Delergio presented his or published his data on the convergent procedure for the converged trial in Cirque P a year ago. So without further ado, we'll get on to our first slide here. So this is the first slide. It, 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 ar it arose from the wellspring of all knowledge Twitter. Um, and my partner sent me this slide recently with the data coming out. And it kind of, you know, I told him it made me cry a little bit inside to see posterior wall in the scrum here. And so my goal today is to get it out of the scrum and put it out in the open and discuss the data. And um, so I think our first piece of data is, first off, congratulations, Peter, on a great study, the Kaplan study presented at ESC. Um, you know, in your study, 338 patients randomized to posterior wall isolation versus PVI for persistent atrial fibrillation. Now, these are new diagnosis, persistent atrial fibrillation, who failed one antiarrhythmic medication. So can you summarize kind of what you found? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Dan. Yeah, so these were first-time persistent AF ablation. We didn't exclude long-standing persistent, but we did exclude patients who'd been in continuous AF for more than three years, which okay. uh, Dave will likely talk about when he talks about Converge. And essentially, this was a randomized study uh, across um, 12 centers in three different countries where patients were randomized to pulmonary vein isolation alone versus uh, pulmonary vein isolation followed by posterior wall isolation using contact force catheters with the follow-up using uh, twice daily single lead ECG transmissions via the Alive Core. And as you can see here, the primary endpoint with all patients completing 12 month um, follow-up was no significant difference in freedom uh, from recurrent atrial arrhythmias of any sort of antiarrhythmic drug between the two treatment arms. Now, now Peter, can I ask you a question about uh, posterior wall isolation? I got a chance to read your methods a bit, but um, first of all, I saw you using high power, 40 to 50 watts, but talk to me a little bit about the methods for posterior wall isolation. And also, right. are you and, and your methods for determining exit block? Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the methodology on this is really important, Dan. So um, patients were cardioverted. So this was done in sinus rhythm. We do the floor line first during CS proximal pacing so we can establish whether we have floor line block before we go ahead and ablate on the roof. Yeah, the power generally was around 40 watts and we used esophageal temperature monitoring in all patients. Once we'd established floor line block, then we would go and complete roof line block and we'd have a circular mapping catheter positioned in the middle of the posterior wall to determine when we'd achieved electrical isolation. And so we were looking for entrance and exit block. Now, were you doing high output pacing on the posterior wall to determine exit block, like uh, you know, ten volts or two milliseconds or twenty volts? Yeah, if there was if there was any question, but it was was generally very very clear. You see the change with floor line block, and then the complete disappearance of potentials. We'd frequently see pulmonary um, posterior wall spontaneous activity. Um, and if there was any um, equivocation, then we'd um, pace inside the block box and demonstrate exit block. Okay, great, thank you. So then, uh, you know, breaking it down into the different subgroups here, can you summarize what you found here as well? Yeah, so we wanted to dice up the data um, and see if there was any hint for, um, uh, whether there were any differences between AF and atrial tachycardias in recurrence, whether there was any difference on or off drug, whether multiple procedures mattered. Um, and essentially, as you can see there, there was no difference between any of the treatment arms. Um, 
what I think was interesting bottom left corner there is that generally the recurrence in AEF was paroxysmal rather than persistent, irrespective of the strategy. And, and also down the bottom there, you have clinical success looking at sort of around about um, 70, 75% in, in both groups, but really no difference between strategies. Very interesting, very interesting. Now, uh, you know, jumping to you, this next slide here, you know, this is your secondary analysis looking at AF burden. Um, and I think it's a very interesting point that the median was 0%. So tell me a little bit more about your finding with burden. Yeah, burden, as you know, we, we talk a lot about what should be the um, primary endpoint in AF ablation outcome studies. And there's a real wrestle at the moment between freedom from atrial arrhythmia recurrence versus burden versus quality of life or healthcare utilisation. Um, and what you can see here is that the median burden was 0% in both cases, which speaks to the fact that generally the recurrence is paroxysmal. It's not that the population was low burden to begin with because the average or mean duration of continuous AF was in fact around about six months. No, it's so very interesting. And I think that's, you know, that brings up, you know, a point I wanted to ask you both. You know, I think in both of your studies, and if you look at a lot of these studies, the secondary endpoint analysis looks at, you know, AF burden reduction or, um, and, you know, the traditional endpoint is right, post the blanking period, 30 seconds of AFib, time to recurrence. But is it time for us to think differently about atrial fibrillation and how we measure it in our studies? No, I completely agree, Dan. I think the, you know, a 30-second recurrence to a patient is pretty meaningless. And someone who's been in continuous AF for 12 months who then has a few minutes of AF or even a few hours of AF, you know, once a month, they would deem that a, a great clinical success. Whereas in our studies, we, we call that a failure. So I think the society generally is very keen to revisit the definition of success. Hey, Dave, your comments on that as well? Well, I completely agree. Um, in the Converge trial, we made an assessment of AF burden reduction and patients achieving a greater than 90% burden uh, reduction uh, was dramatic in our study arm. Um, also clinically, I've used loop recorders in all my convergent patients if they don't already have a atrial lead from an implanted device. And we've seen a dramatic burden reduction and quite sustained over time. And I think it does correlate with uh, uh, clinical parameters of success. So burden reduction is very encouraging. What you do notice is that people do tend to still have little bits of atrial arrhythmias. So some patients will be completely atrial arrhythmia free, but that's not true of most patients. Thank you all for joining us for part one of the uh, of the posterior wall isolation discussion. Stay tuned for part two coming up as a further release. <laughs> <laughs>